Thank you. Thank you. So, <clears throat> if you guys are familiar with uh, my lectures, you know that um, my sort of uh, um, one true goal in life is to help people understand that human beings are not carnivores, we are not omnivores, we are strict and complete herbivores. And it's important to understand that for a variety of reasons. One, because it helps explain a lot. For instance, uh, throughout this conference, and I'm sure other uh, plant-based conferences you've attended, you've heard people go over the fact that being and uh, becoming plant-based uh, lowers your risk for a variety of chronic diseases, helps you have greater longevity, decreases your risk for dementia and uh, dysfunction as you age. Um, I think I didn't catch all of John's talk, but what I did hear, he talked about some of the many health benefits associated with uh, uh, being plant-based. Plant and other uh, lecturers have gone over the importance of being plant-based with respect to reducing our carbon footprint on this planet and obviously the benefits to uh, our companion animals on this uh, earth that we share this uh, our planet with is um, it's very clear Sorry. does it keep going out or something Um, okay, do I have to play, start playing now? Because I wasn't going to start till the middle. Okay, all right. Well, let's see how it uh, Yeah, now it's. <laughs> yeah, um, again, can't have fun without at least some technical difficulties. But anyway. Um, so, <clears throat> so what we're going to do today is focus on the, the human aspects of, of, of why we should be vegan. And um, again, there are many reasons, including uh, it's the fact that it is the ideal health, uh, a diet and healthiest diet for humans. It's the diet that puts us at peace with uh, our fellow earthlings. And it's also the diet that's best for the planet. And it's, um, importantly, the diet that best facilitates communication with God and helps, us bring, and helps bring us into harmony with him. Now, why is a vegan diet the healthiest diet for human beings? Well, um, we are anatomically and physiologically herbivores, as I mentioned before. We're not carnivores. We're not omnivores. Um, and what we, there's also uh, psychological uh, uh, evidence to support the fact that we are herbivores, and we'll go over that in a minute. And um, that will be shown by the way that we both relate to uh, animal tissue and also the uh, things that plants and flowers uh, can do for us. Um, so first, let's just talk a little bit about the anatomical and physiologic uh, aspects of humans that make us strict herbivores. So how many of you guys like me love to watch um, kind of nature shows, you know, shows about animals? All right, great, everybody. All right, well, if, you, if, you, if you're a bugs and worms junkie like me, as some of my friends call me, you know that when carnivores go out to hunt, most of the time that they attempt to hunt, they are not successful. Uh, typically, uh, in the wild, a carnivore will be successful in terms of actually obtaining a meal about once every seven to 10 days. And estimates are that 95% of the time that carnivores go out to uh, procure meal, they're actually unsuccessful. Now, think about that. If 95% of the time you sat down to eat a meal, somebody snatched your food away, how could you avoid starving to death? Or would you avoid starving to death? 
No, you absolutely wouldn't. You would, we would all cease to exist. If 95% of the time we tried to eat food, it was taken away from us, we could not survive. So how is it that carnivores can miss a meal 95% of the times that they try to eat and still survive? Well, it has to do with the fact that they, are cons they have very, very different gastrointestinal tracts from human beings. Carnivores have gigantic stomachs. The stomach of your typical carnivore can hold up to 30% of its body weight. So that means that a 300 pound lioness can eat somewhere between 90 to 100 pounds of flesh at a single meal. A 45 kilogram wolf can, huh, sure. Okay. I'm going to grab the microphone and go over sure. there and we, okay. we set it up. Don't right. worry, there we go. Go ahead. Um, a 45 kilogram wolf can um, eat about 15 uh, kilograms of, of meat at a single meal. So, um, and a wolf, 45 kilogram wolf is actually smaller than your typical adult, but they can eat about 45 pounds uh, of food um, at a single meal. How many of you can do that? <laughs> Nobody. Um, and that's one of the reasons that carnivores, carnivores are able to survive. Furthermore, their jaw structure is very, very different from ours. When you look at the uh, way the jaw is constructed in meat eaters, their jaws are constructed like a pair of shears meaning that their jaw joint is on the same plane as their cheek teeth, and when their jaw closes, the blade-shaped molars in the upper jaw slide vertically past the uh, blade-shaped molars in the lower jaw, giving you a nice slicing motion. And as a result, they're able to cut through tendons, hides, uh, crack bones, slice flesh off bones, and swallow their food whole. And that's another key difference between carnivores and herbivores. Carnivores don't chew their food, they just swallow it whole. Herbivores, on the other hand, are completely different. The jaw joint in herbivores has moved to a position above the plane of the cheek teeth, giving the lower jaw an L-like shape. And when the jaw closes, the flattened molars in the upper jaw come down right on top of the molars in the lower jaw. And instead of closing in a vertical fashion, the jaw actually slides across in a horizontal fashion, which gives you the motions of grinding. And that's because all plant food contains fiber, uh, which is uh, undigestible carbohydrates. And the grinding motion of the lower jaw allows the uh, motion of chewing, which helps to disrupt that fiber and expose the uh, plant material to digestive enzymes. Another difference between carnivores and herbivores is that herbivores have enzymes in their saliva. And we have an enzyme in our saliva called salivary amylase, which actually starts the process of digesting carbohydrates as we chew our food. And <clears throat> that's critically important because Another very interesting thing about human beings is that as humans, we have six times more starch digesting enzymes than any other primate species. Why would that be? Why would we need so many starch digesting enzymes? What is starch made up of? Come on, somebody had chemistry. Okay, starch is a carbohydrate, but if you look at a, a starch molecule under uh, or drawing of it, what is it made up of? Huh? What? Sugar. Yes. Starch is just long chains of sugar molecules attached to one another. And the reason you need starch digesting enzymes is to release that sugar. So why would humans need six times more starch digesting enzymes in any other primate. Somebody out there has a big head, come on. It's because of these giant brains that we have. Do you realize that every day, your brain, which only accounts for 3% of your body weight, 
uses 25% of the energy you burn in a given day. I mean, think about that. 3% of your body accounts for 25% of the energy you utilize in a 24-hour period. That is a huge expenditure of energy and it makes the brain the most metabolically active tissue in the body. And what does the brain use exclusively? Glucose, sugar. And so in order to supply our brains with the energy it needs in the form of, of glucose, we have to have a tremendous ability to generate starch for, uh, or a release of sugar from the starches that we eat. Um, <laughs> I tell you, this thing is being stubborn today. It's just, it's just being like super, super, super crazy. Um, at any rate, um, and the, the other major difference, as I mentioned or alluded to earlier between carnivores and herbivores, is that um, Herbivores are batch feeders, meaning that every herbivore has to eat multiple times every single day just to get enough energy to last them one day. Whereas carnivores, as we mentioned previously, can eat today and not eat again for another seven to 10 days and they'll, ju they'll be just fine. Huh? It's, it's, does, why does it keep going out? You can't it without it, actually. Oh, you okay. You're crushing it. Yeah, we're crushing it. Okay, we can. N yeah. We can read from here, maybe? Right? Um, well, let me ask you this. Does yeah. anyone else have Keynote on their computer? What's Keynote? Keynote on the Mac. Because if somebody has a thumb drive, it's just, I have some really cool pictures that I really wanted to show folks. Um, it's just bizarre that it, it I know, and I don't know why it's happening this. I think so, I mean, I could transfer this to a thumb drive and use someone else's computer. You have a thumb drive? So uh, does anybody have a thumb drive I could? You can send Listen. it by email? Uh, oh, that, that file is a couple gigabytes. It would take forever. Um, damn. I don't think I brought my thumb drive with me. Um, uh, Maybe we can show it like this. <laughs> You can all read it, right? Oh, okay. Can you read cool. it from the back? Said just say yes. <laughs> yeah, is it, I think it's. Uh, uh, okay. All right. Excellent. Okay. I bring the other computer. Wait, wait, wait. Huh? Just it, it's it's a presentation. Oh. Oh, so it's, it's... It's something on the presentation. It's not uh -huh. something on the presentation. It's not the... It's not the cable, huh? It's the presentation? I don't know. That's what uh, we uh, need. You want to open your computer? Here. With the thumb, 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 thumb drive. Right. Like. Somehow we'll, we'll make it work. Yeah. You know. We can give extra minutes to this. So we'll, we'll All right. Give me, the give me one second. You know what? Actually, um... Little Ivan, you can rap? <laughs> Where is it? He can rap. Um, vegan Ivan, you want to come and rap something in, on the stage? Everybody can rap for the Vegan Ivan. Really come to the stage. Let's huh? try this really quick. It's a whole okay, thing. Okay, okay. Maybe sure. Badass Vegan can help as well. Like, featuring Badass Vegan, no? <laughs> All right. Yeah. 
Why no. isn't this communicating? Yeah, you have to fill in and help me again. The presentation is a problem. Not only no, this is, a, this is a different you version. You help the ecosystem. This is a different version? Yes. What about you don't the water test no. things you had? Don't sit in the tree of the fresh. That's this. very fresh. So right. it's two. And then Let me see if I can load this up like, here. We add you. So go over here again. It's the best thing to do. It'll help you the air. Wait, hold on. It's PDF. It's dead. Hill. Oh, wait, this is about to come Thank up. Thank you so much. Awesome. Okay. I know. Okay, wait a minute. You can do it without it? Yeah, I and can. And how, like, as a reference with you? Sure. sure. Yeah. I mean, it, it, this is just extra anyway. Okay. Uh, no, no, no. Okay. I think it's not. That's what okay. You can uh, open and have it with you. All right. Thank you. Okay. Okay, here we are. Don't review. Okay, you can you can open for yourself because it's not gonna work in the. Okay. Is the program? Sure. Uh, um, all right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, for some reason, uh, this just does not want to play today. So we're just gonna move ahead. I apologize for that. Not sure this has never happened before, but I guess it's the first time for everything. So. <clears throat> So again, um, the, uh, we talked about the stomach. Herbivores, uh, carnivores have very, very short digestive uh, systems. Their small intestines only about three to four times their body length. Whereas in human beings, uh, like uh, most herbivores, the small intestine is up to uh, 10 to 12 times the body length. Now, in an average human being, the small intestine, say in a six foot man, will be about 30 to 35 feet long. And remember I said that the small intestine is 10 to 12 times body length. So if I got a six foot man and his small intestine is, let's say 30 feet long, does that fit that, uh, those parameters? Does that mean that his uh, uh, small intestine is uh, 10 times his body length? Who says no? I wanna see a show of hands. Yeah, I'm scared because you know I'm about to, I'm about to trick you, right? <laughs> All right, actually, remember, you don't measure body length from head to toe, you measure it from head to tailbone. Average torso length in uh, humans is two and a half to three feet. So yes, once again, we have the typical structure of a committed herbivore. And then when you look at our large intestine, the large intestine in carnivores is very short, straight, and smooth, and the reason is by the time any residue gets to the large intestine, it just needs to be eliminated from the body as quickly as possible because it, it contains no nutritive value and the longer it remains in the warm interior of the body, it starts to rot, putrefy, and release toxins. But again, very different for carnivore, uh, from herbivores, excuse me. And why is that? It's because plant food contains fiber. And if you can break down that fiber, you can absorb additional nutrients and energy from that plant fiber. And so in the plant eaters, you have two modes of fiber digestion. You have what are called the four gut fermenters, which are the ruminants, like cows. These are the animals that have very, like four stomachs, um, and they actually ferment their fiber right up front. And then you have hind gut fermenters, like horses, rabbits, uh, and primates that ferment their fiber after they've extracted all of the readily available nutrients from it. And human beings are classic hindgut fermenters. The uh, colon in hindgut fermenters is very long relative to the body size. It has a very pouched or saculated appearance and that's to increase its capacity. And it typically houses a population of bacteria or a microbiome as it's currently known uh, that can then break down these plant fibers into a number of physiologically um, uh, active and beneficial compounds. Uh, but there's a problem, because if you have the large intestine of an herbivore, but you are eating a animal food-centered diet, what ends up happening is that you select for a microbiome or bacterial population that is not uh, uh, geared towards breaking down plant fiber, but it's actually more uh, um, aligned with um, essentially putrefactive action on uh, 
animal protein residues. And the problem with that is that when the bacteria act on these animal protein residues, they release some very, very toxic compounds like hydrogen sulfide, uh, uh, cresol, um, and a number of other very toxic compounds, and, and uh, including uh, um, trimethylamine oxide. Um, uh, and these compounds can then damage not only your blood vessels, but they also can interfere with brain function. Uh, studies in um, an animal model has shown that uh, when herbivores are fed animal protein, and those animal protein residues get to the uh, lar large intestine, the bacteria there actually break or, or essentially rot the um, uh, protein residues, re uh, release toxin, uh, toxins like cresol, um, things called cadaverine and putrescine that when absorbed go into the bloodstream and actually cross the blood-brain barrier and interfere with the ability of neurons or uh, neural cells called oligodendrocytes to do their job. And what's so special about oligodendrocytes? Oligodendrocytes are the neural cells that actually wrap the axons of uh, neurons with a um, insula insulation called myelin. And myelin is necessary in order for neurons to transmit signals properly. And when that process is disruptive in these animal models, it correlates with um, behaviors that in humans are associated with anxiety, depression, uh, and other uh, mood and behavior disorders. Now, in my citing of this, re this research, please don't think that I am putting my stamp of approval on animal research. It's just that because the research has been done and it does show something very compelling, I think it's important to at least uh, uh, acknowledge uh, that we have a model to help us understand how uh, eating the wrong foods can result in uh, uh, central nervous system uh, damage that results in uh, some of the problems that we see. We also know that uh, diets that are high in animal protein promote uh, uh, elevated levels of inflammation in the body, and studies have shown that the higher the amount of inflammatory compounds in one system, the higher your risk of going on to develop uh, Alzheimer's and uh, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, so on and so forth. So I mentioned earlier that human beings are psychologically herbivores. What do I mean by that? Well. Again, when you look at the way carnivores and herbivores pursue and procure their food, they do so in a very different manner. And why is that? Well, the fundamental uh, um, uh, fact is that in nature, survival is a uh, function of energy out versus energy in, meaning that if you expend more energy looking for and acquiring your food, then you can extract from that food, what happens? You starve to death. So every creature, every species, tries to find its food in the most energy efficient fashion possible. Does that make sense? So what that means is that when carnivores go out to hunt, they do not go out and look for the biggest, strongest, healthiest animal on the savanna. Why? It's because that's the animal that's likely to either outrun them or if they were to catch up with that animal, it's likely to injure them or kill them when they're trying to kill it. So as a result, carnivores actually look for weak, diseased, uh, defective, injured, or elderly prey. And by doing so, they actually strengthen the gene pool of the animals that they prey on because they are weeding out the defective genes. You feel that? You get that? Well, the herbivores are doing something totally different. The herbivores don't want the dried out, blasted, you know, uh, broken up uh, vegetation. Why? Because that vegetation has no nutritive value. So herbivores spend all of their time look, moving from place to place, trying to find the freshest, the most lush, verdant, 
um, plant food uh, available because that is a plant food that has the highest nutrient content. And so in one sense, you can say that carnivores look for ugly food, whereas the herbivores look for beautiful food. You feel me? But what do humans do when we go out and start hunting? Do we go out and look for the uh, deer that has a tumor growing out of its neck? Or the one that has a, 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 a broken leg? Or the one that has you know, puny t little antlers? Or the one that's you know, old and elderly and slow? No. We instead, because we are herbivores, we want the biggest and most beautiful animals out there. And when we go out and kill those animals, we extract the best genes out of the gene pool, and that's why hunting by humans drives animals to extinction. Is that clear? But it gets even better, because um, I was reading an article uh, several years ago on, um, uh, from the psych uh, psychology literature on the phenomenon of disgust. And it turns out that disgust is one of the six emotions that all humans are born with. So now, we all have experienced the sensation of disgust, and there are certain things and certain people that we find disgusting. Like, for instance, most of the ones that are entering around the White House. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, I, I, I see Sarah Huckabee and I have to take a, a Zofran. Um, <laughs> but turns out that there are certain things that all human beings across all cultures find disgusting. And what's, further, what's really interesting about disgust is that disgust has three domains. There's what's called sexual disgust, moral disgust, and pathogen disgust. Well, sexual disgust is designed to protect humans from unfavorable social, uh, sexual pairings that can result in non-viable offspring. So what kinds of things are covered by sexual disgust? Incest, pedophilia, and that feeling of revulsion you get when you see Donald Trump with an 18-year-old blonde. <laughs> that's sexual disgust. Well, we're going to leave that aside because that's not the topic we're going to focus on. But then moral disgust actually deals with antisocial behaviors. So that's the type of revulsion that we feel when we see people being violent or lying, stealing, and bullying, because these kind of behaviors are disruptive for a social species. They make it very difficult for families and for society to uh, uh, function if somebody's out there, you know, basically killing people, murdering people, beating up on people, stealing other people's uh, uh, sorts of uh, um, uh, property. And our revulsion to violence is actually so strong that we have to have a reason to kill. And a lot of times those reasons are absolute BS. But nonetheless, we still have to come up with a reason if we're going to kill anything. And you know, one of the standard cliches whenever there's a new uh, serial killer that's identified is that the neighbors come out and say, I always knew there was something wrong with that boy because he used to kill cats in the neighborhood. And we recognize that this propensity to kill without provocation or without reason is abnormal and is defective. And it will bleed over from abusing and mistreating animals to also abusing and mistreating people. But the real key comes when you look at pathogen disgust. So what are the characteristics that across cultures all humans find disgusting? They're things that are moist, wet, slimy, bloody, things that have an amorphous shape, things that are covered with flies or maggots or worms, things that are covered in hair, things that are rotting. Well, if you think about it, I've just described raw animal tissue to you. And that is why we humans, when we get ready to eat animal tissue, 
We don't eat it in its native form. What do we do? We have to extensively modify it. Now, think about edible plant parts. Think about an apple or a, a squash or a cabbage or a carrot or a pear. Edible plant parts are typically hand-sized objects that are rounded, smooth-edged, have a firm texture, and of course are brightly colorful, colored, and taste like plants. So what do we do to make animal tissue acceptable to us? We take the skin off of it, we cut it into these round, hand-sized objects, we take the blood out of it, we then cook it to make it firm, and the most telling part is what do we cover it with to make it taste better? Plants. So you see, what we're doing when we modify animal tissue in this way is we're trying to make it mimic edible plant parts so that our brains will actually want to eat this stuff and not be repulsed by it. Because I guarantee you, even the people who are running around saying, oh, I'm a carnivore, I, I love me. If I were to take a ragged, bloody, wet piece of rotting animal tissue and plop it down in front of them, they would throw up they would not want to eat it. But I guarantee you, your dog has never said to you, well, I'm not gonna touch that meat until you cover it with you know, some garlic and onions and cook it and, and then present it to me with a gar you know, some uh, a parsley as, as a, uh, uh, a, little, a little garnish. So again, very different in the ways that we approach animal tissue. And again, it's because we are herbivores and we don't want animal tissue in its native form. And that's why I tell people when I give this lecture called Meat Eating and the Biology of Disgust, that you may eat meat, but you don't like it. Because if you really liked it, you'd eat it in its native form. But you have to extensively modify it and try to make it look and taste like plants in order to make it acceptable to you. Now, some people have said, well, why is it that vegetarians are always trying to make you know, uh, products that look like meat. Well, you see, what I explained to him is actually, that's kind of like Victor Victoria. You remember that movie? Victor Victoria was a woman playing a man playing a woman, <laughs> or, or, or vice versa. So actually, when we take these uh, tofu or you know, soy products and, try to, and make it look like a veggie burger, we're actually just doing an homage to the meat eaters and their attempts to make their dead animal tissue uh, look like plant parts. But really, we are actually being true to our nature because firm, rounded, uh, hand-sized objects are what you find in the plant kingdom, not the animal kingdom. Well, it even gets a little more interesting because one day I was out walking my dog and uh, we were walking and we came across some irises. And I personally think irises are some of the most beautiful flowers in existence. And they really, really affect me emotionally. And I was sort of standing there kind of admiring them and just sort of taking in the emotional and uh, sensual experience of these beautiful flowers. And my dog, uh, Onyx, she was a black lab. She walked up to them, sniffed them, and peed on them. <laughs> and I thought, hmm. That's interesting. So here I am, I'm emotionally moved by these flowers and she couldn't care less. They're just, you know, something for her to mark her territory. And that got me to thinking, why is it that human beings are so emotionally moved by flowers? Why is it that we find flowers beautiful? And then, so I started to think about, well, what is beauty? Is beauty just something that we make up in our minds, or is it actually something that's hardwired into our genes? Well, you can get a clue by looking at what humans find beautiful in each other. When scientists have looked at what we as humans find beautiful in each other, what they realize is that the things that we consider beautiful, um, the things that men find beautiful in women, that women find beautiful in men, and if you're LGBT, that you know, women find beautiful in women, men find beautiful in men, are things that correlate with uh, 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 health, fitness, and reproductive uh, ability. So, for instance, uh, the round hips in a woman, the symmetry of the face, 
you know, um, the uh, symmetry of the breast. These are all things that correlate with the ability to bear children. Likewise, in men, broad shoulders, uh, tall stature, muscular build, again, these are things that correlate with reproductive fitness and, not, and the ability to help rear children to, from birth to adulthood. So physical beauty are attributes that correlate with fitness and improved survival. So then that begs the question, why is it that we find flowers beautiful? Well, what are flowers? Flowers are actually harbingers of future food. If you see a peach tree with flowers on it, you know that if you come back in, you know, six to eight weeks, you're gonna have something to eat. And because plant foods were so important to our survival as a species, we learned to find the appearance of flowers beautiful because that let us know this is something that we need to be attracted to, that we need to make a, uh, 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 a mental note of and come back and in the uh, future, we, we will uh, find food. Let me read you um, a couple statements that I wish I could show you, but uh, unfortunately, I can't. Uh, let's see. Let me find it. Um, all right. OK. Um, I'm going to try and turn this around and, and, and so you guys can see as much of it as you can see. So this first slide says food as currency. And what it says is food is important because it is essential to the existence of every living creature. And it's, it is the original and only true primary currency. This fact is understood at some level by all higher animals from arthropods on up. And you know that when spiders go a courting, the male spider usually brings a little piece of food wrapped up in silk to the female because he figures if she's eating that, she's not gonna eat me. <laughs> uh, all of the myriad forms of invented human currencies ultimately derive their value from food. However, indirectly, if one could conceivably invent a form of uh, currency that couldn't be used to obtain food, ultimately it would have no value because food equals life. And for those of us living in the 21st century, America, it is perhaps difficult to understand and appreciate how uh, the true importance and centrality of food to our survival. This is because for us, food is a given, and that is it's ever present, accessible, and easy to come by. But this phenomenon of readily available food uh, and reliable food sources is actually very new in human existence. Um, and for most of our history, Food had been relatively scarce and subject to the caprice of nature. And as a result, until relatively recently, the desire, need, and search for food had been this prime motivating force in human societies, even more so than the search for sex. Uh, and the, uh, perhaps the importance of food to humans is best and most clearly demonstrated by the central roles it plays in our lives, families, cultures, cultural interactions, celebrations, social intercourse, and interpersonal discourse. I mean, we don't do anything without doing it centered around food. And this is a quote from Michael Pollan in his book called The Botany of Desire. It says, people who were drawn to flowers and could further distinguish among them and then remember where in the landscape they had seen them would be much more successful foragers than uh, those who were blind to their significance. And this is from uh, a Harvard psychologist by the name of Steven Pinker. He says, natural selection was bound to favor those among our ancestors who noticed flowers and had a gift for botanizing, that is for recognizing plants, classifying them, and then remembering where they grow. In time, the moment of recognition, much like the quickening, would become pleasurable and the signifying thing, a thing of beauty. And you guys, like me, were probably taught in uh, uh, high school, college, whatever, that human beings were hunter-gatherers. 
and that, you know, women sort of waited at the door of the cave, waiting for their man to bring home some bison, right? That's a big load of male bovine fertilizer. <laughs> Human beings almost certainly were always primarily plant eaters. And fortunately now, there are a number of articles coming in, uh, in the anthropolo anthropological literature, excuse me, that are highlighting this. There's an important article by um, a, a researcher by the name of Clifford Jolly uh, called The Seed Eaters, where he talks about uh, the importance of plant foods to the development of the human species. And very recently, there's another article, and I can't unfortunately recall the name of it, that argues that it was the search for fruit and fruiting plants that actually drove the development of human intelligence. And again, that makes sense because, let's face it, it doesn't take a lot of brain power to try and chase something and kill it, number one. And number two, if we don't have modern technology like guns and so forth, we are lousy hunters. But it does take a lot more brain power to, one, recognize the relationship between flower and the fact that eventually you're going to have some food and then to remember where you saw that flower so that you can come back, you know, six weeks later and find the food and then store it, cache it, and use it for your future survival. Um, but our love of flowers actually tells us something even more deeper about ourselves. So again, since all of you like me watch these nature shows, you know that very frequently um, when um, wolves or bears are out hunting and they come across a dead carcass, what do they do? Eat it. Well, they, if, I mean, they'll eat it, but they also typically do something else. They roll in it. They'll actually get down and roll all in that dead, rotting carcass. Why do they do that? It's because when they go back to their pack mates, they are saying, Honey, you want to stick with me because I know where the food is. So if human beings are meat eaters, why don't we decorate ourselves with scraps of tissue and perfume ourselves with the smell of rotting uh, flesh? What do we like to wear? Flowers. What kind of scents do we perfume ourselves with? Flowers. Huh? Well, I mean. In, in modern society, yeah, we're kind of silly enough to use petrochemicals, but what we're actually, we're still basically doing an homage to the fact that we want to smell like plants and flowers. And that drive within us is so strong, we even uh, use lemony fresh cleaners to mop our floors, and we hang these pine scented things in our cars so that it'll smell like the outdoors. That's how much we need these plants. Well, actually, when you look at the compounds that give plants their scent, these are some important compounds. Let me see if I can find that slide. It turns out that those same chemicals that give plants their scent are, uh, uh, come from a family of chemicals that when we ingest those same chemicals, those things are very powerful antioxidants and immunostimulatory agents. So they actually make us healthier. And that's why we want to smell like these things. And there was actually a study that was done that showed that, um, and where they had Meat-eating men uh, wear T-shirts and vegan men wear T-shirts and had them go out and run around and do some things. And they took the T-shirts and had women smell the T-shirts. So the women had no idea who wore what. Across the board, the women preferred the smell the T-shirts from the vegan men. So we know that chemical compounds like echinacea are uh, uh, and uh, digitalis are derived from flowers and things like rose hips. But this is really what I want to show you guys is that when you look at these phytochemicals in foods that 
The same compounds that are used in the fragrance industry when they're ingested, uh, as I said, have very powerful beneficial effects on our uh, physiology. This is just a list of just, a, I mean, myriad, myriad plant compounds that are important in terms of helping to boost our health and physiology. Uh, here's some more. And unfortunately, I know you guys can't read this because it's not projected up here, but trust me, it's, it's pretty amazing. Um, and when you look at phenolic acids more closely, fruit polyphenols, which are found in a variety of berries, uh, these are very, very potent antioxidant chemicals uh, that, again, help protect us from disease, boost our immune system, and actually enhance fertility. So across the board, we see that uh, in a number of different ways, and I'm going to try to wrap up here. Uh, plant foods are central to our existence. They are important uh, for helping to um, uh, improve uh, our health and viability as a species. But I also don't want to finish without mentioning, as I said, the fact that uh, plant-based diets actually help facilitate uh, closer interaction with God. And I'm just going to tell you my own personal experience as an illustration of this. Um, I became plant-based uh, originally when I was a teenager. I joined the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and the Adventist Church recommends, doesn't require, but recommends that all members become plant-based. And approximately half the members will become either vegetarian or vegan, and half continue to eat meat. Well, initially, I was one of the 50% the that continued to eat meat. And that was because I absolutely thought I could not live without eating animal tissue. I remember that visceral feeling of, oh my God, I can't live without a hamburger. And so for over a year after I joined the church, I was still eating meat. But I was struggling with some personal issues. And one night I was actually talking to God about the, the struggles that I was having. And he said to me very clearly, he said, if you want a closer relationship with me, you need a clearer mind. And for that, you need a better diet. You have to stop eating meat. And I said, well, God, if you want me to stop eating it, take away the desire to eat it. He did. And that was in September of 1974. And I immediately started to feel the effects of not putting toxic dead tissue in my system. I felt better. I had more energy. I needed less sleep. As I told you, I was a teenager, and my acne cleared up uh, overnight, um, or w w certainly within a week. And it was so clear to me that this was healthier for me and better for me that that's when I decided to dedicate my life to helping other people understand that we don't have to live in fear that our bodies are going to fall apart, that they're going to become cancerous, and that our heart is going to rise up and attack us like some thug from, you know, God knows where. That if we eat the diet that we were meant to eat, we can live long, healthy, happy, and productive lives. And so right before I close, I want to say one other thing, because I get a lot of questions from people who become vegan, and they try to, and you know how you are, how we are when we, when we learn something new and we realize how wonderful it is. We want everybody to come along and be right where we are right now. And it can be very frustrating when we deal with family and loved ones and they are like, I don't want any part of that. And I, I even know some people who won't go home for things like Thanksgiving and other family meals because they feel like, you know, I can't be around people who are not being vegan and not eating. I think that, I'm gonna tell you my personal opinion. Personally, I think that's the wrong thing to do because I think that God has appointed each and every one of you as an ambassador of truth and that you can't take this truth that you've been given and hide it under a, a shade. It's meant to be taken out there and shown to your family, shown to your friends, shown to the world. And yes, you're gonna get a lot of pushback, but 
We all have had that experience of sitting in a dark room and somebody turns on a light. What happens? It hurts your eyes. So you shouldn't be surprised that initially when you share this light, this truth with people, they may not be able to receive it. But you got to be patient with them just like God was patient with you, patient with me. I didn't spring from my mother's womb a vegan. That's a process that I had to go through. So we have to be patient with our family and our friends and give them the time to grow and still be willing to stand in there and, and, and bear that light and be that source of truth. And like I tell people all the time, if you're a trailblazer, you're going to get cut by the bushes. But those cuts will heal, and ultimately, you're going to make it easier for the people that follow you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do we have any time for questions? Um, yeah. Oh. Anybody has a question, maybe? Yeah, perfect. Oh, there we oh go. wow. Great. Yeah. Many, actually. Yeah, for sure. Um, um, here, uh, I think. You can use that one. And you can uh, let's, well, OK. Uh, my question is, why did humans start looking for food in the desert? OK, very good question. So the question is, why did humans start to eat meat in the first place? And the answer almost certainly is that as humans migrated out of equatorial areas in Africa where plant foods were available year-round and started moving into more northerly climates, plant foods weren't available during the winter months. And so we started uh, using animals for the calories that weren't available during the winter time. And that's almost certainly when we learned to start eating other animals to survive. Clearly, that might have been a survival strategy that was important, you know, 10,000 years ago. We now have Safeway, Giant, you know, Lucky, Albertsons. We don't need to kill animals. We can get away from that, and it's time to let that behavior go. Of the world that eat a lot of vegetables and most likely organic and non GMO, and sure. but yet they eat their grass. Right. They, they think they're right about it. Sure. Uh, well, the first thing I would tell Michael Pollan is he needs more fiber in his diet. Um, <laughs> if you get my drift. Um, but the fact is that, and um, we could have an entire conference just talking about how animal foods damage our bodies and our physiology. But one of the things that you will find, and, and again, um, I want you guys to assume that it's not me up here talking, it's actually Sarah Huckabee, and everything I'm telling you is a complete lie. <laughs> Go home, Google it for yourselves, and you'll find out that this is the absolute truth. Animal tissue, animal protein, is toxic to human beings in any amount. So any exposure to animal tissue increases your risk for all sorts of diseases. So, you know, you can eat grass-fed beef, it's just tarted up garbage. It's still unhealthy, it's still something that our bodies are not designed to eat, and ultimately it will kill you. Yes, this young lady right here. Hi, thank you so much. Um, people who are uh, like religious people, Christians who hate uh, your factory farming, they say it's horrible, um, but like they're against it, we're on the same side, you know, but as long as it's done in a humane way, God will put it on the earth for us. You sure. Would, you know, be more educated uh, yes, I, I'm glad you asked that question because that's something I didn't have a chance to get to. First of all, um, there's no humane way to kill somebody, okay? Um, and you all know that if I came up to you and said, you know what, 
I'm, I, I'm going to eat you, but I'm going to kill you humanely. That would not pass muster with you, number one. Number two, um, this, this idea that God put animals here to be eaten by humans is complete garbage. If you read Genesis, and this actually, um, uh, a couple months ago, I was uh, invited with a Jewish friend of mine up to New York to do a series of talks on what the Bible has to say about plant-based diets and animal rights. And I actually sat down and reread the Genesis account of creation, and I was blown away by what I read because things that I had not noticed before jumped out at me in a way they had never done before. If you read chapter two of Genesis, so Genesis kind of gives you a big overview of creation, and then it sort of zeroes in and gives you a closer and more detailed account. And in chapter two, God is talking and they create Adam. And then they say, it is not good that the man should be alone. So what does God do after that? He created the animals. And then he brought the animals to Adam one by one so that Adam can give them names. In other words, Adam recognized that these were sentient beings who deserved recognition of their, for lack of a better expression, personhood. So the animals were Adam's first friends and companions. And it was from seeing the animals with their mates that he then realized that he didn't have a mate. And that's when God created Eve for him. And also in Genesis, the first chapter, the first instructions God gave to human beings was on what to eat, and none of it included animals. Now, people say, yeah, but God gave us dominion over the earth. Well, he also gave Jesus dominion over us, but Jesus didn't start eating us, did he? <laughs> All right, thank you guys, appreciate your time. Thank you.